Hi viewers, welcome to Sunset TV. This is the news where we take you through the, through the day's top national and international stories. Let us first begin with the headlines. BJP's national executive meets in Hyderabad. Party chief Nadda lists government's welfare schemes in inaugural address. Slams opposition on corruption and dynasty politics. Deadline for withdrawal of nomination ends for, for presidential elections. Draupadi Murmu and Yashwan Sinha to two stays to garner support. Uddhav Thakra removes Maharashtra Chief Minister Eknath Shinde from Shiv Sena. MBA fields candidate for Speaker's post. Elections to be held in Special Assembly session that starts on Sunday. Railway set a record of carrying 125.50 metric tons freight in June, 12.72 metric tons more than May. Monsoon covers India ahead of time. Heavy rains in many parts of Gujarat. Floods continue in Assam. Manipur landslide death toll rises to 25, 38 still missing. A look at the top stories in our flash segment. Union Minister Jitendra Singh underscores need to involve startups in carbon neutral building construction. He says it can help India achieve 500 gigawatt non fossil energy capacity by 2030. India and the European Union conclude their first round of negotiations, trade and investment agreements. The week long negotiations were held in a hybrid fashion. New Delhi terms U.S. organization's remarks on India biased and inaccurate. Says comments by its panel on international religious freedom reflect severe lack of understanding of India. On the sidelines of the BJP National Executive Meeting in Hyderabad, INB Minister Anurag Thakur interacts with media organization, apprises them of welfare measures undertaken by the Modi government. Defence Ministry announces start of recruitment process for Army and Navy Agnivis under the Agnipat scheme. Second round of foreign office consultations between India and Dominic Republic held in Santo Domingo, meeting reviews entire gamut of bilateral relations. Niti Aayog releases book on Ayush-based initiatives and practices adopted by states and union territories to contain and manage COVID-19. Indian Army and Air Force conduct joint landmark cycling expedition from Delhi to Dras. Event will commemorate India's 75 years of independence. India's largest floating solar power, fully operational. NTPC announces start of commercial operations of the Ramagundam Solar PV project. Nine people, including a juvenile injured in mass shooting in Newark, America. Incident comes less than a week after the President Joe Biden signed a gun safety bill. The two-day BJP National Working Committee meeting began on Saturday in Hyderabad. Prime Minister Modi, Union Minister Goyal and BJP President Nadda started the proceedings. Paying homage to Bharat Mata and pictures of Shama Prasad Mukherjee and Deen Dayal Upadhyay. All top party leaders including Home Minister Amit Shah and Defence Minister Rajnath Singh were present. In the inaugural speech, party president J.P. Nidda listed out the welfare policies of the centre. He asserted that the last eight years have seen the BJP government work constantly for the empowerment of women and youth. He also condemned the incidents of violence against BJP workers in West Bengal Kerala and Jammu and Kashmir. Bharat Ek Matra Vodesh hai jaha pachis mahine asi karod nagriko ko muft ka rashan Bharat Sarkar ke saujanye se pahunchaya ja raha hai taki samaj ka wo varg hum surakshit kar sakhe the BJP National Office bearers also met to decide the agenda of the Working Committee. The Working Committee meeting will conclude with Prime Minister Modi's speech on Sunday. 
The Prime Minister will also address the Vijay Sankalp rally at the parade ground on Sunday evening. The two-day special session of the Maharashtra Assembly will begin on Sunday. The new speaker will be elected in the House. BJP's Rahul Narvekar and the Mahavikas Agari's Ranjan Salvi are the two contenders for the post. Shiv Sena President Uddhav Thakre has expelled Maharashtra Chief Minister Ekna Chinde from Shiv Sena. He said Chinde is being removed for anti-party activities. The Chinde faction has countered that it will challenge the move to remove Chinde from the party legally. Meanwhile, Maharashtra Chief Minister Shinde left Goa for Mumbai along with the MLAs of his faction. The Shiv Sena has issued a whip to party MLAs for the election to the Speaker's post. Shiv Sena MLA Ranjan Salvi is the candidate of Mahavika Sagari for the post. Chief Minister Eknath Shinde is expected to move the confidence motion in the Maharashtra Assembly on Monday. The last day for the withdrawal of candidature for the presidential election ended on Saturday. Papers of only NDAs, Draupadi Murmu and the opposition's Yashwan Sinha were found valid. The presidential election will be held on the 18th of this month. Both candidates are now touring different states to ask the state legislators for their support. Murmu is on tour of Chennai and Puducherry. She was greeted by CM Rangaswamy and BJP state president V. Saminathan. Yashwan Sinha is touring Telangana. He said the election is between two contending ideologies at a gathering organized by Telangana Rashtra Samiti. Chief Minister KCR appealed to all MLAs and MPs to vote their according to the conscience. The four suspects in the murder of Taylor Kanaya Lal in Odaipur have been sent to a 10-day NIA custody. A team of the National Investigation Agency and ATS produced them in a Jaipur court on Saturday. BJP leader Kapil Mishra met the victim Kanaya Lal's family members in Odaipur and announced assistance of Rs 1 crore collected through a fundraiser. Curfew was relaxed in Odaipur for four hours on Saturday. It was imposed in seven police station areas due to tension after the brutal murder on Tuesday. Kanaya Lars was murdered over a post on social media. The Home Ministry has handed over the investigation into the brutal June 21st murder of Omesh Kohli in Amravati to the NIA. The NIA will prove the conspiracy angle and the likely role of international organizations in the murder. On June 21, Kohle was killed with his throat slit in Amravati, Maharashtra. The Amravati police arrested four people. According to the police, the victim runs a medical store and had put up social media posts in support of Nupur Sharma. In other news from across the country, Chief Justice N.V. Raman on Saturday asserted that the judiciary in India is answerable to the constitution and the constitution alone. He was addressing a function organized by the Association of Indian Americans in San Francisco, USA. Union Cooperatives Minister Amit Shah said the idea of cooperatives is the best way to realize the vision of inclusive development. He greeted people of the country on the 100th International Cooperative Day. The Union Home Ministry has amended rules related to the foreign Contribution Regulation Act to allow Indians to receive up to 10 lakh a year from their relatives living abroad. The limit earlier was 1 lakh. An Ahmedabad court sent social activist Tista Sitalwaran, former Director General of Police, R.B. Shrikumar, to judicial custody for 14 days. They were arrested for fabricating evidence in the Gujarat riots case. 17,092 new cases of COVID-19 were reported in India in the last 24 hours. There has been an increase of 2,379 active cases. The number of patients under treatment has risen to over 1,9,000. The ban has been lifted on the entry of devotees in the Sanctum Sanctorium at the Kedarna Temple. The ban had been imposed on May 6 for security reasons. The death toll in the landslide at a railway construction site in Manipur's Noni district 
has risen to 29. 38 people are still missing. Meanwhile, another landslide took place in the same district. Teams of Army, Assam Rifles, Territorial Army, SDRF and NDRF are continuing rescue operations. 13 Territorial Army personnel and 5 civilians have been rescued. Bodies of 18 Territorial Army personnel and 6 civilians have been recovered. Search is on for 12 missing Territorial Army personnel and 26 civilians. Manipur Chief Minister N. Biran Singh took stock of the rescue work on Saturday. He said the operations were facing difficulties due to rain. The southwest monsoon has advanced across the country with the onset of seasonal rains in Gujarat and Rajasthan. It has come six days before the normal date of July 8. Southwest monsoon started over Kerala on May 29, three days before normal. So far, the country has recorded a rainfall deficit of 8%. Meteorologists expect rains to pick up pace in the coming days. Meanwhile, heavy rains brought life to standstill in Gujarat. A flood-like situation has risen in low-lying areas of Surat, Banaskanta and Anand districts. The Meteorological Department has predicted light to moderate rain in many parts of states over the next five days. Heavy to very heavy rains have been predicted in districts of South and Central Gujarat and Saurashtra Kutch areas. Now time for a short break. On the other side, for the first time, the UN highlights concern over road safety, raises funds for safety projects. Hypersonic glider is nothing but a ballistic missile which travels into high altitudes and when it is gliding through the atmosphere, its velocities are hypersonic. Hypersonic means it is greater than 5 Mach. The speeds are so high, hypersonic weapons have become, become something like, you know, deterrent weapons. Devastating speed and with impact on a target with virtually no warning. And unlike ballistic missiles, these are expected to be far, far more effective in the long run. Watch our special presentation in The Defenders only on Sunset. Welcome back after the break. Now time for all the main developments from the Russia-Ukraine war front. In the latest updates, President Zelensky accused Russia of state terror as missiles rained down on Ukraine on Saturday, killing many civilians and wounding dozens as the weekend began. Strikes on a su southern resort town of Sergivkia left 21 dead and dozens wounded after missiles slammed into flats and a recreation center 80 kilometers south of Black Sea at Port of Odessa. Ukraine forces shared footage of what they claimed was Russia's bombing the Snake Island. General Valery Zolonisi, commander-in-chief of the army, forces of Ukraine said a pair of Russian Su-30 warplanes carried out strike against the island using phosphorus bombs. Earlier, the Kremlin portrayed the pull-out of Russian troops from Snake Island as a goodwill gesture to help unblock exports of grain in the area. Russian forces destroyed five Ukrainian army command posts in the Donbas region with high-precision weapons and also struck three storage sites of Zaporozhia region. The ministry said the Russian air force had struck a Ukrainian weapons and equipment base at a tractor factory in Kharkiv in northeast Ukraine. The U.S. is sending Ukraine two surface-to-air missile systems four counter-artillery radars and artillery ammunition to assist Ukraine in its fight against the Russian invasion. The Pentagon on Friday said the additional material will come as part of the latest U.S. assistance package for Ukraine. Russian state media reported that two British men have been captured by Moscow's forces in separatist-held Ukraine. They are being charged with being mercenaries. Cambridge aid worker... 
Dalian Healy and military volunteer Andrew Hill have been charged with carrying out mercenary activities. Russia claimed that both men were refusing to cooperate with the investigators. Ukraine has requested Turkey to detain and arrest a Russian-flagged cargo ship that is carrying a cargo of Ukrainian grain, according to Ukrainian officials. The Ukrainian Foreign Ministry officials said the ship loaded the first cargo of some 4,500 tons of grain from Bediangs, which the official said belonged to Ukraine. Now time for some other global updates. The UN raised $15 million in pledges to fund road safety in low- and middle-income countries during 2022-2025. It is the first time that the world body has highlighted the need to invest in safe, resilient and sustainable road safety systems for countries and regions that are most in need. A UN high-level meeting on global road safety has noted the importance of road safety in low- and middle-income countries where about 93% of the world's fatalities on roads occur. Nepal, Armenia, Iran, Jamaica, Kenya and Qatar are among 15 partners that pledge to mobilize funding to ensure coordinated, targeted actions to fund vital road safety projects. What we need finally, uh, all vehicles in each member states need to comply with minimum UN safety standards. We need integrated road safety into national policies like urban planning, education. The countries also underscored the need for road safety to be recognized in national budgets. Abdullah Shahid, president of the UN General Assembly, said that in most countries, investments in road safety remain underfunded. So, with close to 4,000 people dying every day on the roads, we have no time to lose. The world body also warned that if the world does not act by 2030, there will be 1.8 million people dying on the roads every year. Bureau report, Sunset TV. The COVID pandemic restrictions have ended for tourism in many parts of the world. But for the tourism industry itself, a full recovery could take as long as the catastrophe itself. According to projections in 11 countries, a tourism rebound is likely to be a bumpy ride for many months. The United Nations says the world's $3.5 trillion tourism industry provides work for 1 in 10 people on Earth. It lost $2 trillion during the pandemic. A survey of tourism prospects across 10 countries suggests that a full pandemic recovery could take as long as the catastrophe itself. Israel and the occupied West Bank offer a snapshot of the difficulties in the post-pandemic climb. India is expecting 4 million visitors this year, compared to 11 million back in 2019. In March, things started getting better, slowly at first. So we had a few good weekends in March, rest wasn't good. And in April, things got better, in May better still. And in June, uh, this June we have been doing good business in a steady way. And uh, we are hoping that this improvement continues. So we are yet to reach the pre-COVID levels of business, but I think we are moving in the right direction. During lockdown, we could not travel much and we were uh, basically bored. Uh, and uh, after uh, post lockdown, we have started uh, traveling and exploring the cities. But full recoveries are generally not expected until at least 2024. Israel is struggling to match its record-setting tourism of 2019 when 4.5 million people visited the country. Despite lifting all restrictions, Israel expects less than half that, about 2 million visitors this year. An unusual convergence of springtime religious holidays for Jews, Christians and Muslims helped boost visitors in April. By May, the number of visitors rose to about 57% of the same month two years earlier. Challenges include inflation, supply chain problems, rising infection rates, labor shortages and short notice bookings by travelers and airport nightmares. And despite virus travel restrictions being lifted, safety is unlikely to recede as a concern. Bureau Report, Censor TV. And in other news from across the world, 
Protesters broke into the East Libyan Parliament building in Tobruk. Because it was a Friday, the building was largely empty. Protests are ongoing in Libya over demands for elections. Libya has two competing administratives, one based in the East and the other in the West. Both are divided on a constitutional framework for national elections. The unrest was sparked a day after the representatives at United Nations mediated talks failed to reach an agreement. Southern Iran was hit by a 6.3 magnitude earthquake early in the morning that left five people dead and many injured. Rescue teams were deployed near the epicenter in Seyakosh village. Because Iran lies on major seismic faults, it experiences one small earthquake a day on average. The area has seen several moderate earthquakes in recent weeks. Hong Kong was buffeted by Typhoon Shaba that brought in high winds and plenty of rain. Although the city itself didn't suffer major damage due to the storm, the authorities raised its number 8 storm warning. Typhoon has affected areas of South China Sea too, capsizing a ship. Hong Kong sent a team to rescue a sinking ship in South China Sea. Only three members of the 30-member crew could be rescued. A Virgin Orbit rocket carrying U.S. defense satellites was launched from a special Boeing 747. The modified jumbo jet took off from Muave spaceport and released the rocket over the Pacific Ocean. The launch was procured by the newly formed defense branch, U.S. Space Force, for a defense department test program. Virgin Orbit is another private player in the space industry that works on different technology than that of SpaceX. Power cuts in South Africa are lengthening due to a worker strike at ESCOM, the country's state-owned power company. ESCOM says that it is unable to cope with breakdowns of its aging coal-fired power plants, insufficient generation capacity and corruption. The prolonged power cuts are hitting South Africans in the winter months of the Southern Hemisphere when many households rely on electricity for heat, light and cooking. Pearl Harbor is once again in the news, ironically as the target of a World War II legacy. Recent investigation concluded that jet fuel from a World War-era tank contaminated water that was supplied to houses and offices in and around the sprawling base. Many people fell ill. Here is our report. In November last year, 6,000 people in Pearl Harbor suffered nausea, headaches, rashes and other symptoms. Investigations found that the local tap water was poisoning thousands of people. It forced military families to evacuate their homes for hotels. For months, the military resisted an order from the state of Hawaii to drain the tanks and close its Red Hill facility. It said that December 2024 was the earliest it could defuel the tanks safely. This led to accusations that the US military was polluting Hawaii's water supply and denying it. A Navy probe last week revealed how a series of mistakes over months led to the incident. The report said that on 6th of May 2021, an operator error caused a pipe to rupture. 80,000 litres of fuel spilled while being transferred between tanks. Red Hill officials had wrongly estimated the extent of the original spill and did not report the discrepancy to senior leadership. Most of the spill fuel ran into a fire suppression line. There, it sat for six months. In November, a car rammed into the line and released over 75,000 litres of fuel into the water supply. After the November spill, people got sick. The military moved about 4,000 military families into hotels. Luckily, the fuel did not get into the Honolulu Municipal Water Supply, thereby leaving the city residents unaffected. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. Now time for some sporting action. Starting with cricket, on the rain interrupted second day of the Edgbaston Test, England was 60 for the loss of three wickets chasing India's first innings total of 416 when play was stopped the last time. Jaspreet Bumrah accounted for all the three English wickets to fall. India showed tremendous resilience in their first innings, being 5 down for 98 and coming back to score over 400 courtesy centuries from Rishabh Pant and Ravindra Jadeja. 
Down the order, Captain Bumrah himself scored 31, not out of just 16 balls. Rishabh Pant's brilliant counter-attacking innings on the first day of the edge Baston test has come for high praise from all quarters. Pant came to bat when the team had lost its third wicket with only 63 runs on board. Soon after, India were 98 for 5. Rishabh Pant, in partnership with Ravindra Jadeja, put on 222 runs for the sixth wicket of only 239 balls. Pant himself scored 146 of just 111 balls that included 19 fours and four sixes. Moving on to hockey, a rejuvenated India would seek revenge against England when the two sides opened their Pool B campaign in the Women's Hockey World Cup in Amsterdam, Netherlands on Sunday. The Indian women's hockey team would be eager to settle scores against a side which shattered their bronze medal hopes in last year's Tokyo Olympics. India's best performance in the World Cup was a fourth-place finish at the inaugural edition in 1974. In tennis, Indian A Sanya Mirza, who is making her final Wimbledon appearance, and Mate Pavic advanced to the second round of mixed doubles event with a hard-fought win over David Vega Hardenson and Natella Zalamidzi. The India-Croatia duo won 6-4, 3-6, 7-6 in the first round match. Mirza has already announced her retirement at the end of this season. John Isner set a new record for the number of aces on the ATP Tour at Wimbledon on Friday, but it was not enough to overcome Italy's Yannick Sinner. The giant American whopped 24 aces but was broken twice in the match and went down 4-6, 6-7-3-6. Isner started his match four aces behind Croatia's Ivo Karlovic, who has served 13,728. Isner, who dumped Andy Murray out of the previous round, broke the record in the third game of his match on court two with his fifth ace. Before the wrap, the headlines once again. BJP's National Executive meets in Hyderabad. Party Chief Nadda lists government's welfare schemes in inaugural address. Slams opposition on corruption and dynasty politics. Deadline for withdrawal of nominations ends for presidential elections. Draupadi Murmu and Yashwan Sinha to two states to garner support. Uddhav Thakre removes Maharashtra Chief Minister Eknath Shinde from Shiv Sena. MBA fields candidate for speaker's post. Elections to be held in special assembly sessions that starts on Sunday. Railway set a record of carrying 125.50 metric tons freight in June. 12.72 metric tons more than May. Monsoon covers India ahead of time. Heavy rains in many parts of Gujarat. Floods continue in Assam. Manipur landslide death toll rises to 25, 38 still missing. That's all we have time for. For more updates, keep watching Sansa Television. Good night. Advanced